Welcome to another edition of Acoustic Alternatives, the podcast normally done at Grove Studios in Ypsilanti, who've been very kind to encourage me to do this. Uh, it's a place that you can set up a brand, band practice, uh, DJs can practice there as well, and podcasts can be done there, and it's a great way to get away from your neighbors and not disturb them, get out of the garage and get into the studio is what they like to say. But this time around, I'm doing something as a benefit for WHFR, which is a radio station that is a non-commercial entity in Dearborn that I happen to work at. I also happen to do a show there, and they are technically my sponsor for tonight's uh, podcast, and it's uh, a live recording with Joe Serapier. Hello, Joe. Hello, John. How are you? I'm well. Thank you very much for giving us your time oh, sure. and your talents to this benefit concert, which is a full concert uh, later on for everybody else. But meanwhile, uh, for you and I, it's a conversation that includes you playing a few songs. Um, I'm uh, hoping that everybody in the room knows who you are off the top of your head. But yeah. But one of the many reasons I do a podcast is I have local music and music from the national music scene that I want to expose everybody to, the world. It's on the World Wide Web, on video and on audio. And I like to choose people that I believe in, and this makes good sense to me to have you on the show. Well, it's hometown. Right. I'm born and raised in Dearborn, where WHFR is. My, my mother, who's sitting in the front row, she went to Henry Ford Community College. Hi, Mom. When I was, uh, when I, I remember being a little girl and us and dropping her off. I was in the car and we drop her off to go to, to go to class. Very nice. Well, before I get into digging into when uh, she knew you as about this big and maybe this big, <laughs> why don't you start with a song? I'll get out of the way if it's going to be the, one of the ones that has one of your guests. You tell me. Oh boy. Okay. Well, no, I'm going to start. So um, I'll, I'll let they're back there. You know, they're getting drunk and you know, musicians, whatever. They're playing music on their phones way too loud. <laughs> Well, I figure since um, I'm going to bring my band, the LaFondas, I'm going to bring them out for the second half. And pretty much what we mostly play is just really fun, heart, you know, lighthearted kind of stuff. So I thought I would play some depressing things. Perfect. That's Yay. what I expect. I don't get a chance to do that very often. And <laughs> So... All right, well this is a song uh, I, I wrote. It's a really fun tune. It's about drunkenness and despair. All right. Stardust and bromide Dream you by my side Forevermore Dance upon ether Troubled by neither The mundane Nor the horror You won't deceive me Never knew what I can't know Dreams never leave me Held in the light of the late, late show You were a sailor Taking your leave of the sea Was a dancer luring my sailor to me. Each promise, like spirits, goes to a young girl's head. Dreams like confetti falling in fountains of red. Friend. Loneliness settles, slowly becomes like a friend. Violence, it lingers, the only thing that doesn't end.
So still in this slumber, only a secret away. A sweet preparation, slowly I'm sailing. Now I'm sad, but in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, my absolute songwriting hero is Tom Waits. I know. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's in you. It's in me, yeah. So. <laughs> Joe Serapier is my guest on Acoustic Alternatives, the podcast. And uh, I'm, I'm imagining, like, my house, there was a, probably always music on at your house. What is your earliest memory of music on in the house? Well, actually, my parents were really... You know, I was... I, was, I, I should probably not say how old I am, but I'm old. Um... I was born in the 60s. So, Me um, too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Late 60s, but Me 60s. Too. <laughs> um, so my parents, uh, I, one of my earliest memories is seeing Beatles records on the floor, like crawling around and seeing like the Beatles. And, and uh, they always had Simon and Garfunkel, Cat Stevens, and the Beatles. That, that was like, that's what my memory, that's what some of my earliest memories of childhood. That's some good stuff. Yeah. I mean, for me, memories of like driving in the car with mom and a track of Simon and Garfunkel's greatest hits is like ingrained in my brain. <laughs> but yeah, for sure. Very influential, I'm sure, on who you became because those are some great songwriters right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when did it hit you? Was it a teenage you that said music? Wow. No, I, w I was, at, well, you know, because I was a kid of the 80s. So um, I was one of those kids that I, I, I grew up and in, in, instead of becoming a musician, I like dated musicians. Oh, by proxy then. Yeah, so, so it was like, you know, because that's what girls did. You know, so, <laughs> and then I would like secretly hate them for doing what I wanted to do. So I decided after getting a whole lot of therapy that maybe I should, you know, it would be better for my relationships if I actually became a musician. So if I talked to your high school friends, <laughs> they would have said, no, I never would have imagined Joe would have been a musician. No, I was really shy. I was like... I was one of those kids that I, I, I you know, I, I, I'd cry if I got a B. I was, I had to get A's. I was always, I was really shy. I didn't, you know, I okay. was a very shy, quiet kid until I got out of high school. Well, you obviously at some point discovered your own musical taste away from the Beatles and the Simon de Garfunkel and Cat Stevens, and that was probably yes. teenage you. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I went through many, many stages, but in, in like early junior high, I was definitely a metalhead. I was, I think I saw Ozzy Osbourne like 10 times or something. I was like, loved that. Backstage, and we were discussing Foreigner and Billy Squire. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I, I outed you on that. <laughs> well, there is. There's somebody, there's backstage. I played, when I played here with my band um, Stella a few, a number of years ago, um, there's, there's graffiti in the back that says Foreigner 1981 or something yeah. like that. And I went, I went to that show, <laughs> and um, and then the, the the rest of the band, you know, looked at me. I, I think, yeah, I think uh, Laura Bates looked at me and said, "I was a toddler," and then and then Jen Siget said, "I was in diapers," and then you know our fiddle player she went, uh, "I wasn't born for another ten years." <laughs> <laughs> These things happen when you hang out with younger people. So I, I gather from some of the darkness in your songs that you might have also been a goth kid. I was totally a goth kid. And that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, how does a, a rock goth kid become a roots artist? Where is, where is the path? Good question. Where does I it... Well, I don't, I don't know. I just, I always went through stages of music. I mean, you know, because, you know, I, I was raised on Simon and Garfunkel. And um, I think it was because when I was in in high school and college, I was, I got much more involved in the LGBTQ community. And um, so like the Indigo Girls and Melissa Etheridge, you know, all these, um, you know, these, they were like our role models. So I think that kind of, but, but actually I think it goes deeper because I do remember um, the first time I heard REM, which, I mean, they're roots rock, 
But yeah. you definitely can hear the twang. Oh, yeah. You know. From Georgia. I mean, how can you not? Right? right, right. I mean, they were playing with, like, culture club, so it was pretty <laughs> clear. But, you know, but I, I loved it. It was just the harmonies. When I heard the harmonies, it felt like home. And then I found out uh, that, you know, my, my grandfather's from Appalachia, so it's, I think it's genetic. There's just something in there. You've mentioned Simon de Garfunkel and Indigo Girls, and to me, there was a parallel in my life because the gateway drug for me to modern <laughs> folk was Indigo Girls. Yes. It, it was Land of Canaan, actually, not, not necessarily closer to find, but oh, okay. it was something that made me, like that harmony was so similar to what I remember hearing as a kid. Yeah, And it was exactly. like, ooh, what is this? And what it opened this? up this, this new world to me. So I just kind of wondered how you got from Sisters of Mercy to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to whatever, wherever you started in the, in well, the rootsy you, rock stuff. You know, even when I was a little goth kid, I loved um, Patsy Cline. Hmm. Like, you know, I, you know, I'd be with my black hair and eyeliner and, you know, in my mohawk or whatever. I'd, when I'd get my heart broken, I'd be like, <laughs> I know he did you wrong. <laughs> did me wrong, too. You know, so I, I just, I wanted to start a goth band that played Patsy Cline covers, but it kind of never happened. <laughs> So did you see the Bauhaus reunion show? Is that exciting to you at this point in your life? Like all four of them? There, I didn't know. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I saw the Wayne Kramer yeah, we talked show about that. coming out, the M- yeah. MC50, I think. Or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so your first no. music, your first, yeah, the, it's at uh, Masonic, not Masonic. Um, so all of the, all all the four guy, of all, oh wow. I know. I was a huge Tones on Tail fan yeah. and, and love and rockets and yeah Bauhaus and more so more so the Bauhaus for me as well but yeah. still the, the parts <laughs> but I still don't I still don't know how even I, I was working in a record store and so I was being exposed to a whole bunch of music and so mm-hmm. that to me that was how I discovered other kinds of music and for you somebody opened that door somewhere along the line and said check I, this out well I don't know no I've always just I've always had my ear to what well, you know music things that were going on at the time, you know, so, and then like I said, I dated musicians, so. I know you play guitar, I also have seen you play drums, at least in photos. In theory. Are there other <laughs> other instruments that you play? <laughs> no. No? No, I, I, I mean, I play drums, but I don't, I, I, I'm like a three, oh, I do, yes, uh, Bob said, I do, I, I, I do play a mean washboard, yes. Oh, yeah, I've seen but. that picture too. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm like a three trick pony on the drums, so. You know, you need a good like stirring, stirring the you know jazzy, stirring the 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 soup. I got it. I'm I'm solid. But do you want to play a song on the guitar, or would you like to go to the drum kit? No, just oh, kidding. No. Guitar, <laughs> guitar, guitar. <laughs> what would you like to do, do next? I need to play one. Okay. Well, you know, um, I'll play a song that was inspired. I mean, actually, one of the things that also got me into roots music, aside from the Indigo Girls and all those folks was um, I took lessons from uh, Sherry Kane. You all know Sherry Kane, right? She's a legend. Um, Sherry, you know, her, her, her focus was um, Delta Blues. And I loved like John Lee Hooker. John Lee Hooker was like my, my uh, you know, one of my blues idols. Not, not that he was, he was Delta Blues, he wasn't, but you know, it was, I just, I just, I just love that. So I, you know, started listening to a lot of old blues and jazz and stuff from there. But, but um, this is a song that I wrote. Um, I, I, I did Lamb's Retreat, which is a, a songwriter workshop up in the top of the mitten. And I was on staff there and uh, John Lamb, who runs it, he, he told me what, what my workshop was going to be on, you know. And he's like, I want you to do a workshop on blues Detroit style. And I went, okay. So, <laughs> so um, I did a, I, I talked a lot about John Lee Hooker because, you know, he's, he's, our, he's our, our guy, you know. Um, and then I wrote this song this weekend because they made us, you know, part of it is you have to write a song. And I love, one of the things I loved about John Lee Hooker is he, um, he was like the beat poet of blues like he would just stay on the one he wouldn't even change you know he wouldn't he wouldn't change chords he'd just stay on the one and do a whole song like boogie chillin you know and so i said i'm gonna do that too so this is a song inspired by john lee hooker but it's it's definitely mine so ready I 
wash you clean. Do it all by hand. Wash away the sins left by a man. Left by his ways. Left by his tools. Left by his laws. Left by his rules. I too had a secret, a dirty shame. Dared not to think it or speak its name. I took the burden and all the blame. I begged for mercy, it never came. Till I washed it clean, did it all by hand. Washed away the sins Left by a man Left by his ways Left by his schools Left by his church Left by his rules Falling down, we'll plant your dirty deep in the ground. We'll tend the soil until you're sound. Your rise up blazing was lost, now found. Dug up, not pretty, dug up, not pure. You share your dirty. We'll share the cure. You tell your story, but only when you're sure. We'll hold it sacred, safe and secure. And we'll wash it clean. Do it all by hand. Wash away the sins left by the man, left by his weakness. Left by his hell, we'll save our dear ones, save him as well. We'll save our dear ones, save him as well. Save him as well. Save him as well. This time around on Acoustic Alternatives, my guest is Joe Serapere, and this is uh, being recorded at a benefit concert for WHFR, a radio station in Dearborn that I will admit I work at. I should admit that to the, the audience who might not know that I do that. Uh, it is a benefit that makes a lot of sense to have Joe play because <laughs> the radio station itself is as diverse as you are. If somebody had all of your CDs... And I'm from the D. And you're from the, the Deer. Little, the, the little D. D, Dearborn. But the little 313. If, if we went through your catalog, we would see <laughs> Americana, we'd see Roots, mm -hmm. we'd see Blues. There's a little bit of jazz in there. There's some honky-tonk. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, there's no category for, I, I, for you. I like everything. I, I was once told by somebody in, you know, higher up in the, in the biz, said, you ought to, like, hone your stuff down, keep it to one thing. And he says, once you get famous, then you can play whatever you want. Is that I'm Dave like, Marsh, by chance? Uh, no, it wasn't Dave. It was... <laughs> It was... Uh, you don't have to tell me if okay. you don't want to. Well, was <laughs> Somebody else. Some other dude. But um, I was like, but that's A, you know, I got to wait till I get famous. Will I even get famous? You know, right? And I'd be so bored. So, you know, that's just not how my process works. I love all kinds of music. Good for you. So Good for you for sticking to what you believe in. There you go. Yeah. Well, at some point you started performing in front of people, not just at home. I was, did. Was it a solo project or a band project? Solo, solo. I was in grad school. Okay. I, um, so I'm a psychologist. So I, I became a psychologist and a musician at exactly the same time. So I, 
I, I, for my, uh, my last semester in graduate school, I went to kind of an alternative psych school. It was called the uh, Detroit Center for Humanistic Studies. It's now called the Michigan School of Professional Psychology, which I think is much more boring. But when I went there, it was, it was in the city and it was Center for Humanistic Studies. And, and one of my last classes was this class on transitions. And it was about, what, what they told us is you had to do something and then you had to, at the end, write a paper, you know, something very, you know, that would transition you into something. And then I had to write an, in the paper, uh, you know, um, if I did it and if I didn't do it, I had to write why I didn't do it. So the night before, and, and I said, you know, I'll, I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a song that I wrote in front of the class. Okay. And, um, and then like the night before, I was just sweating bullets. I'm like, oh, man, I can't do this. And, um, and then I opened, up, uh, I opened up this book, and it talked about... It was, it was just exactly what I needed to hear. And it's, it talked about the importance of failure and, and how, you know, failure isn't failure. It's just, it's just, you know, it just gives you feedback on the next step. So you just have to, you know, find the courage and do it. Or I don't know. It touched me in such a way that I said, okay, screw it. So I went in there and I played. And it was like I felt better then than I think, like, than being on any, like, being on Prairie Home Companion or any of the other stuff we did. It, that, that was when I felt the highest. I was so excited for facing that. And, and so then for our, um, our graduation, I said I'd sing in front of the auditorium, and I did, and then you couldn't stop me. I was, I was obnoxious. Music was your therapy, <laughs> for yes, sure. Yes, it was. Well, your first CD, which there are plenty of copies here at the, the show in, at the Trinity House, in case anybody yes, in the room wants. Yes, and if you buy a CD, you know, to use as Tonight. a poster, yeah, you can get the first one for free because they're, they're cluttering up my basement. <laughs> I got way too many. Well, that one came back out, uh, that one came out in 1998, a year that I looked at the, the just to see what was happening in 98 because I can't remember. The pop charts were dominated by mostly R&B, mm. poppy country, things like Shania Twain. Oh, yes. But however, there was a couple of other things that might have had some influence on what was going on. Uh, Paula Cole and Sarah McLaughlin had pretty big hits that year, and Lilith Fair debuted the year before. Yes, I applied for Lilith Fair. Really? I, did, I didn't make it, but I applied. So was this, did, did that like... <laughs> empowerment of, of women music have anything to do with you following music as a career? Um, well, I mean, it definitely made it an option. You know, I think, you know, uh, I mean, you know, one of my, I, I, I love like, I love garage rock bands and stuff. So, you know, I, one of my, my favorite bands is like the Runaways, you know? And when they came around in the, in the 70s, like people booed them and throw, threw stuff at them and, you know, and, and like girls didn't play guitar and they didn't sing rock music or whatever. So I think when, when I started playing, there was a lot more just opening for that. Okay. Like, you know. The doors had been open already. The kinda. doors were already open, but that was kind of the beginning. Well, four years later, 2002, a pretty big year for you. Live at Johnny's Speakeasy was released, as well as the debut album from Uncle Earl. Both yes. out of print. Yes. One of them I'm seeing on resale shops for hundreds of dollars. <laughs> the Uncle Earl debut album <laughs> is out there for tons of money. Well, uh, there, that, that's, I have one regret in my life. Just, just one. That's it. So, so Uncle Earl, which was a band that my friend Casey Groves and I started together. We, in Ann Arbor, we were just kind of, we liked doing harmonies, country mm -hmm. harmonies, so we just started doing that. And we started the band, and then um, we started getting some, you know... Attention? Some attention, but I ended up kind of turning into just sort of the, the, the tambourine player or something. You know, like I, I, I wanted to write songs, I didn't want to play old time music. So, um, so I quit the band, you know, so they could go off and whatever. And then the following year, they recorded with uh, John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin. My only regret, because I was the Zepp head in that band. I don't even know if they knew who Led Zeppelin was. They, they learned. They learned, <laughs> yes. But I was like, what? <laughs> Did you drop out because you didn't want to do a lot of touring? Was there... Yeah, and I just didn't, yeah, I just felt kind of useless, I mean, in some ways, because I wasn't a picker, oh. you know, and, and they were, you know, they were getting better and better players, and, you know, 
Um, and I was just like, I just, I'm just kind of singing on the sidelines here, and I'd rather be writing songs. Did you ever do a great deal of touring outside of the Michigan music scene? We, we toured You, like, yourself. Oh, or me. any of it, at any point in your career, I guess. Well, Uncle Earl, we did a tour in Colorado, and um, I learned what it's like to sing in the mountains. That's brutal. Breathtaking? <laughs> I like, would pass out on stage. It was horrible. Um, and then uh, I, when I was playing with my partner, John, um, we would tour. Bet- we, like, I, nem- I remember one day, I think we had... Uh, I think we had one day, or uh, about 24 hour. No, no, no. It was 48 hours. We played in Boston, and then we played in Austin. So we had to get there that's, in 24 hours, and we did. We got there in 24 hours. So that's a lot of driving. Yeah, it was. A little crazy. Speaking of John, you have two friends that are joining you during our podcast for your songs. Yes. I don't know which is first, though. Well, we can have Johnny come. Is is Johnny out there? Johnny, paying attention back there. Did somebody get him? He's He's coming. The answer is he's coming, which means I'm going to step away. Talk about the song. All right. Hi, Johnny. This is John Devine, everyone. So, um, Johnny, Johnny is my, my baby daddy. <laughs> You'll notice uh, my daughter Stella. I have a band and a daughter named Stella. My daughter Stella did not want to come tonight because she's like, I, I like am, she loves to be home alone. She's like, I am so tired. I am your music. Oh my God. She liked coming to our game when she was five. <laughs> So I'm going to play a song. Like I said, the, 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 the next set is just going to all be upbeat, fun stuff. So I thought I would play some more depressing stuff because I don't get a chance to do that very often. So this is a, a, a song. Let's see, how should I introduce this? It, um, I know somebody once asked um, Mother Teresa what she thought the biggest problem in America was. You know, thinking that she's going to say, like, you know, hatred, violence, whatever, greed. And she said loneliness. And I thought a lot about that, and I think, I think that's true. I think loneliness is a, a, a kind of pivotal. We, we don't feel connected to each other. And that's kind of the cause for a lot of problems. So this is a song called Loneliness. You don't see me, I'm not there How can I trust the world to care? The source for once it came was never you But the wounding left behind is all I knew It returns and I'm closing down I say my peace but I'm not around Look at me and I'll confess my loneliness. Shine pulls around me, sleep tonight. I'll be less afraid beneath the light. You only hear your voice and not my cries. So I'll settle for the glow from my own. It returns, no one sees me here Can't find a way from underneath the fear Loneliness Loneliness Just look at me and I'll confess My loneliness Turn around and not burden you 
I tend to my own, yes, that's certain too. I let you in when your heart burns true. And trust in spite of world not shining through. Forgive me if the darkness wins this round A light within the mind is rarely found But a heart so broken open just might find A never-ending fire left behind It returns Promise me that it's not the I love him. <laughs> Good. One John for another. <laughs> You're both extremely handsome. Mm, so. No, the man in the hat's better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where was I? I Collaborations, know. actually, was what I was going to talk about next, which you just did one with I, I did one. John. Mm -hmm. But Stella is a collaborative project you've worked on. Mm -hmm. um, you've worked with, uh, at some point, Stuart is a Stuart Frankie collaboration. I did, well. Uh, mm -hmm. Uncle Earl obviously qualifies as collaboration. Yeah, yeah. I started that one. So. What am I missing? Uh, let me think. Oh, I, I was in an a cappella group called Lorelei. Oh. And, um, yeah, we, uh, we sang at the Super Bowl. When the Super Bowl was in 2006, or no, really? when, when was the Super Bowl? My daughter was born. Yeah, 2006, because I she was born the end of the year. So, but we sang we sang at the uh, um, at the gates. We we weren't like the mid, you know. We yeah. were, <laughs> you weren't on the you weren't on the field. <laughs> yeah, I like to say it was a whole bunch of like old, like smaller level um, Motown bands, and then like the four of us, us four white girls. It was sort of like affirmative action for soul singers. We were like, so we did a lot of Supremes and it was cool. Are there people in the local music scene or even the national music scene that you've thought about wanting to work with that you just haven't gotten around to working with yet? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. You haven't thought about it. Well, I, I'm sure I have, I, you know. Just not today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was always a, I, I was like a huge fan of Jack White before he got huge. Um, I always liked him, and then he blew up, and I was like, okay, well, that's not a, that's a <laughs> He probably won't work with you at this point, but you never know. He's in town tomorrow <laughs> singing the national anthem at the opening day, so. Oh, he is. Well, my friend Dominic uh, Davis, Dominic. He, he's the, he's, he's his the bass, bass player. player. They went to high school together, so, you know, I'm, I'm like a degree or two. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I am too. I worked with his first cousin, and yes, I know Dominic pretty well as well. So yeah, I always, I, I, I love, I always loved him. I love the White Stripes, and um, um, I don't know. I mean, I, there's a lot of people, and I've worked with a lot of people. Like I've worked with Jill Jack, and I've, you know, like a lot of the the folks. Chris Buhalis, I think I did my first art show with him. Yeah. So. So how about? Uh, Future recording projects based on your musical taste. It seems like a Tom Waits covers album should be in there somewhere. <laughs> You've done Chocolate Jesus with Stella. I have, yes, yeah. Are I would. I I was thinking of being a, just a Tom Waits cover band, or that and a T, or a T Rex cover band. What would you call it? Uh, uh, meat clown. Meat clown. I, I don't. <laughs> 
Isn't that taken already? <laughs> is it? Is it taken? Let's look it up. Well, I have to tell you, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a meat clown pin because it just so happens my friend Barb, she came by and I, I did a post about meat clown, you know, meat clowns, and she made me a pin and just gave it to me tonight. And I'm like, ah, oh, we have merch. <laughs> We're all ready for the meat, meat clown world tour. <laughs> Well, while you're working on the Tom Waits covers <laughs> album in your head, basically your life is a juggling act. Mother, wife, singer, songwriter, therapist. And I'm, I'm uh, um, rehabbing a house in Detroit, and I yeah. have no idea what I'm doing. How do you find time to even think about writing songs? Uh, Are you? You know what? Well, sometimes. Well, no. I'm Right now, I'm recording. So I have like 100 unrecorded songs. So That's 100? Probably. Um, but I'm, I'm going to put out, I'm right now recording a, a record. It's going to be sort of a double record. Um, although I don't, you know, people don't buy one CD. I don't know if they'll buy two. So maybe it'll just <laughs> be two different records. But it's, I'm recording um, uh, with Dave Roof, nice. Rooftop Recordings mm -hmm. in uh, Grand Blank. Yeah, I, I won't go anywhere else. Dave is, Dave's the man. Cool. Um, but I'm doing it. It's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's like I'm, we're doing the La Fondas, which is a lot of, you know, um, kind of Western swingy kind of stuff. And but this is more my songwriter stuff. It's a lot more kind of Beatles influenced. So that's what I'm working on now. So I don't I don't want to write more because then I'll. Yeah, you got enough. I'll need. Um, yeah. yeah, I already feel overwhelmed. Is there a timeline on your new projects? Projects, plural. No, that's the nice thing about being old and not caring anymore. And not being on it's a label. <laughs> no, no pressure from your record label. No, nothing. I'm like, I'll, it'll get done when it gets done. <laughs> uh, as a therapist, do you ever take, without using their names, inspiration from your patients? Um, probably. Yeah, um, I mean, I never, I never do like a direct, like, oh, this is a thing and I'm going to do. But I guess they probably would hear it eventually, wouldn't they? Probably, yeah. <laughs> No, no, I don't. But, but I mean, just the whole, well, like that, the song I just did, Wash It Clean, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's essentially what I feel like I do as a therapist, you know? Good point. So it's, so it, it, it all works together. And I, and I like it because it's, um, like, I, I, I think only, I think I only went on a longer tour. For me, a long tour was like a month. And I think I only did that once. And by the end of it, I was so sick of myself. I was like, I was... <laughs> Cause, cause music is so it's so ego, you know. It's like look at me, I like my songs. What I, and so by the end of the month, I I just was so tired of that. You know, I don't have the strongest ego in the world, so I was like this. I felt terrible. So I I, I like the balance. I like like being in that position to do more service because that makes me feel sane. Did you choose therapy as a career and then follow music as a passion, or did you hope to make music your career and then therapy was, a, if I don't make money doing music, I'll still have this? That. that. Second one? Yeah. yeah. That's actually a pretty smart move, because it is really hard to make it in the music industry. Nowadays, you, it's almost ridiculous. And, and, and now I'm kind of like, what it would take to do that is, I'm, I'm tired. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Live in your van, make no money, which was fun if you're 20, yeah. but you know. Did you choose therapy because you yourself sought it as a younger person and you thought, I want to help people well, just like somebody helped me? Um, kind of, but my, my mom uh, is, is a retired therapist, so oh. I'm the child of a therapist. Um, plus, I was crazy and I you know, needed to figure things out. I think a lot of people go into therapy originally. I mean, because who would do it, right? It's, we're like the lowest paid white collar. I mean, it's, it's like being a priest, you know? Um, uh, <laughs> that actually you don't make a lot of money and it's a lot of work and it's, a, you know, it's like being a doctor but getting, you know, paid like a waitress. But um, so I, I, but I, I, I think a lot of people go into it trying to figure themselves out and figure, you know, and I, I had a lot to figure out when I was younger. So. I've noticed there are lots of songs with Jesus references in your catalog. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're not a religious artist by no. like. You're, you're, I would not put your CDs in the religious section of a record store. No, well, I'm I'm very I'm very spiritual, but I was uh, you know my my back my I was raised, you know I was a uh, I'm I'm like Catholic once removed. Yeah. You can't get away from it, you know. Plus, uh, Johnny, my partner, he was in the seminary when he was younger, so we, he was also a recovering person. I was I was never a Catholic. I was my parents 
we were like Unitarian, you know, we ate tofu and stuff. It was, we were hippies. But, um, but I was, I, you know, I, like I said, I got none of the doctrine and all the guilt. So Nicely done. Yeah. So um, it's just that, you know, our culture is so affected by, you know, religion. And I'm, you know, I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of, of Jesus, the guy, at least the way I understand him. Yeah. I, but I'm not a huge fan of a lot of... Organized religion? Yes, yes. I said exactly. it for you. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I was mentioning the Indigo Girls being my gateway drug into modern folk. The gateway drug into your music was actually Jesus in a Snowball because it just caught my attention. Like, this is a great song. I love the harmonies and it's a fun story. We, 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 we offended, like, we were told we offended five million people uh, it's, uh, on, it's on Prairie Home It's a snow Companion. globe. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's a snow globe. Listen to the words. Not that hard. Well, that was that was a that was a collaboration with Johnny, you know, because jo Johnny is a very funny, like, he's he's one of those kind of writers that like throws stuff out, and I'm the one who catches him, you know, because he he he's very funny, but he doesn't write it down, so. <laughs> well, your musical taste is all over the place, yes. and I I was thinking of asking a strange question: Go ahead. Pearl, Pearl Bailey or Pearl Jam? Oh. Pearl Bailey. Yeah, because your your tastes lean. You're an old soul. Yeah, I'm an old, I, I, but you I like, like rock. Bowls. I do, and I like Pearl Jam. But um, I think I was I was kind of moving away. I was getting more into roots music by the time Pearl okay. Jam Fair came enough. along. But um, I like them too. All right, we're gonna take questions from people in the audience after your fourth song. Oh, okay. So this is a time to bring out your other guest. Okay. Well, I'm gonna bring out my my dear dear friend Michelle Held. Uh, does somebody want to go? Oh, there she is. Hi, Michelle. Everyone, this is Michelle. If, if you're not aware of Michelle, Michelle is an, she's like a captivating performer. She's got this voice and it's, um, so, I mean, obviously she's going to sing back up with me, so you're not going to really get a taste, but, but she's very talented. If you haven't seen Michelle, go see her because she's, she's, she's kind of like the, the Joni Mitchell of, of Detroit, I think. Thank so. you. Okay, so we're going to do a song called Life and All. Mike Ward back there is clapping. <laughs> oh, it, was, it was Angie. Huh? Oh, it was Angie. <laughs> of a right and wrong and I love between a hymn and a victory song I love in spite the promises put upon the shelf and I love the deep forgiveness that I give on to myself I even love your hurtful words though in truth I can't recall Cause it's all so deeply beautiful Life and all One can't resist the ecstasy We all are sure to fall Cause it's all so deeply beautiful Life and all It's all so beautiful It's all so beautiful It's all so deeply beautiful Life and of insatiable lust and I love the deep communion of our delicate trust 
And I love the mad destruction before resurrection's grace and the equalizing destiny we all must someday face. Every moment we recall the light to guide our way and know where time is helping sort the infinite display and return to play our scenes in the splendid cabaret and know the fragile beauty of an ordinary day. One can't resist the ecstasy. We all are sure to fall. Cause it's all so deeply beautiful. Life and all. It's all so beautiful. It's all so beautiful. It's all so deeply beautiful. Life and all. It's all so beautiful. It's all so beautiful. It's all so deeply beautiful, life and all. It's all so deeply beautiful, life and all. <laughs> Michelle held everybody. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, John, as well, earlier for performing. Uh, thank you, Joe, for being here. Does anybody have any questions that I can repeat on the microphone so it's part of the actual podcast? I can't see you, so just shout. Shout. Now I can see you. And they're, this. they're silent. They're all silent. They're silent. What's a La Fonda? Um, well, uh, does anybody see uh, Napoleon Dynamite? Yeah. <laughs> Not in a while, but yes. <laughs> It's now it's officially my daughter's favorite movie. Oh. She, I just I just played it for her. No, actually though that wasn't. I mean, I'm sure that's where he got it. But um, the original incarnation of the Lafondas, we were. Uh, I had Drew Howard playing pedal steel, and um, he also he often played with Stella. And so I I told him I said if you're going to play with Stella, you need you need we need to dress you up in a wig and put a skirt on you. And what's your name? And he looks at me and he goes, Lafonda. So. <laughs> Um, no, it's Captain Midnight. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two bands now, like like you know, uh, you know, um, Captain Midnight and 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 the Lafondas. It's like he's named two different yeah. you know, bands in town. So, um, so it was really from Drew Howard. There you go. All right, nobody has any questions. Question. Question. Yes. How would you feel about your daughter getting into music? How would you feel about your daughter getting into music? Is the question. Well, she is. A f she does play violin. She plays. Uh, um, she's much more of a. She's much more into art. Um, I whatever she would want to do, I'd be totally behind her. I mean, it's a hard life. I mean, you don't make any money. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's it's being an artist is tough. But she's. I think she's going to be a a, a a a visual artist anyway, because that's her thing. So I would. I'd have no problem. We I we I kept we kept pushing it on her, you know and. <laughs> You have two careers. She can have two careers, right? She can do whatever she wants, yes. Very good. Well, thank you very much for doing this for WHFR, a benefit oh, concert yeah. for the radio station in Dearborn, whfr.fm, if you want to find out more information about that. What is your website? It is joesarapair.com. I'll spell that because, you know, it's a terrible It'll be on the video. But oh, yeah, is the, it? Okay. Yeah, but, but it's, you can. It's J-O-S-E-R-R-A-P-E-R-E.com. There you go. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. I'm really, really grateful to you for doing this, and I hope that I get to do more of these. I don't know if I get to do more of these because it'll rely on a sponsor, but this one I'm sponsoring with my love of WHFR, so that's how we're making this happen. Thank you to everyone who's here for the show in person, 
And there's more music coming up after about a 15-minute-ish break. Sure. Thanks for coming. (laughs) 